Our next speaker is uh, Herbert Simon. Now, since virtually all of you here could give a long speech about Herb Simon and his accomplishments. He's the Richard King uh, Professor of Computer Science and Psychology here. Uh, he began his career as a political scientist at the University of Chicago. He taught at uh, uh, Berkeley, the Illinois Information and Illinois Institute of Technology, and he came to Carnegie Mellon in 1949. Of course, he has a special relationship with Raj as using uh, Ed's theory of grand of Ancestry, he's actually the grandfather of Raj thesis wise. Uh, and as you know, Herb's uh, lifelong research theme has been about um, human problem solving and bounded rationality. And uh, I think we'll all agree that Raj is one of the greatest exemplars of bounded rationality. Uh, I've been working with Raj for many years, and I can tell you he has bounded rationality. Uh, he has unbounded enthusiasm and creativity, however. Uh, as you know, uh, so Herb, uh, as I said, came here in 1949, and if you now look back, you can see that Herb has been the author of uh, Carnegie Mellon's leap into information technology, and his, his program has made Carnegie Mellon the preeminent university of information technology in those 50 years? 50 years. Um, he's, uh, he has, um, as you all probably know, he has won the Turing Award, the Nobel Prize, and the National Medal of Science. Uh, so he has, 50 years ago, or 49 years ago, he seized Carnegie Mellon, and he seized a lot of us, and he has sort of moved us all into a, the age of information technology. So it's a real pleasure to have her conclude this session. Thank you, Jim. Well, Ed Fredkin has told us the bad news. <laughs> and now I'm going to tell you the good news. I do have to start, however, with one story about the past, since that seems to be de rigueur this morning. Uh, in fact, a teletype story. Uh, Al Newell also had a teletype to communicate with uh, uh, with uh, Cliff Shaw out at Santa Monica when we were building the we were building LT, and he lived in an apartment down on Phillips Street on the second floor, uh, and there also was a time difference that led that teletype to run at odd hours, and the neighbors were very puzzled about what that teletype was that was going in the second story of this apartment building. They finally figured out what was going on there. Al was operating a bookie joint. <laughs> now, uh, all of us uh, who have been speaking this morning have certain reputation, if that's the right word, notoriety perhaps, as futurists. Various incautious moments of our life, we've made predictions, we've estimated uh, asymptotes and done all those sorts of things. So I'm not going to make any predictions this morning. I'll talk about aspirations. But of course, if you really aspire to something and work hard, the aspirations are going to come true. So uh, we don't have to quibble about whether we're making predictions or talking about aspirations. The aspiration of AI, and that's been its aspiration from its beginning, it's been an aspiration before the beginnings of AI, because you can treat this back to, uh, trace this back to aspirations in classical mythology. Uh, our aspiration uh, is uh, to simulate all human intelligence. Uh, and like the computer, the hardware computer, uh, the important question is whether there are any limits in nature that prevent us from doing that. Uh, not only limits in principle, but can we say anything about the limits and how much they're going to slow us down uh, on the way. Now, really, that's not a single goal, it's two goals, and that's been recognized in AI from the beginning, because there are two reasons why we might want to simulate all human intelligence. Uh, the first is in order to build uh, expert systems, because we're lazy creatures, and if something else will do it for us, we can stay in bed. <laughs> Don't have to have meetings at this hour of the morning. Well, I shouldn't say that, because I'm an early bird, but 
some people complain about getting up in the morning. So first, to build expert systems which can do the kinds of things that we human beings try to do with our heads, with our bounded rationality that's just been referred to. But a second reason for uh, simulating all human intelligence, of course, is to know ourselves, to understand human thinking and the processes uh, that are going on. And this also has an energy level. I mean, it has to be done at least with present hardware, unless we can incorporate some of these new ideas in the, in the brain. Uh, has to be done with a physical device which has energy dissipation uh, and all that. Not enough energy dissipation to keep most of our waistlines down. It's another issue. Uh, <clears throat> but it also has another side. It really is dealing with bits. And therefore, we shouldn't have to, the new idea that I got from Fred this morning, we shouldn't have to worry about uh, those other crass limits. The only limits we have to worry about are limits to uh, bits. Now, what have, in fact, been the limiting factors on achievement uh, over the past 40 or 45 years uh, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence? And in spite of the fact that we have, as I'll point out, a lot of it floating around today, that is intelligence, uh, there have been some limits. We haven't gone, we, we haven't today uh, arrived at the goal of simulating all human intelligence, just as the biologists have not quite arrived at the goal yet of, of uh, uh, mapping the whole human genome. Well, we can go down the list of possible limits, and the first part of this job has been done already for us, computer memory and speed limits. Now, the question is what the standard is here. Uh, whether you want to do some computations that take a billion years at current rates or what, what you want to do. Uh, in this case, the problem is to get computers which will handle computations of the order of magnitude that human beings do, for starters. If we want to exceed human beings for expert systems purposes, then we want to expand those limits. But to get up to the human level, we have to have computers that can do, uh, can do the kinds of things human memory and the human uh, brain uh, can do. That has not been a real limit since, what should we say, 1980. The, we can talk about the billions of neurons in the human brain. When we talk about that, we have to talk about what a neuron can do. We know what some things a neuron can do. We can know it can send a signal across a synapse in one one thousandth of a second. Who would go to the nearest store to buy or even receive as a gift a computer which could send a message from here to there in one one thousandth of a second? So we're dealing with a really slow device. Uh, and memory, well, the real limiting factor on human memory may not be the number of neurons to store things. It may be how fast you can get things into memory. It's true of computers sometimes too, isn't it? Uh, and we know something about that. And what we know about that suggests that you never do fill the memory in your lifetime. I'll soon be testing that. <laughs> but uh, so that, that filling it isn't the problem. And at the rate at which you can get things in, we're talking about millions. If you want to multiply that by 1,000, it's all right. But we're still talking about numbers that are well within the scope of the kinds of computer memories we do build uh, all the time. So humans achieve the intelligence we have and the expertise we have uh, needing only one millisecond to create a cross a synapse and having, or needing a one millisecond, and having at most a few gigabytes of memory, and probably not that. Now is software organization the limit? Now we are down to bits already and we don't have to worry about energy. Uh, loss and the second law of thermodynamics anymore. Uh, software hasn't been a real pro well, we have to talk about two levels of software. I'm talking about basic programming languages at the moment now. Software has not been a real limitation on artificial intelligence since about 1960 with the invention of list processing languages and the development of really good operable list processing languages and production system languages. We have language capabilities 
that allow us to do the kinds of intelligent things. We can put memory structures into memories without having to uh, foresee what they're going to be, to plan them in detail. We can modify them in arbitrary ways. We can link them up and associate them in arbitrary uh, ways. Uh, we've had learning uh, systems and a variety of learning mechanisms at our disposal since that time. One of the early, uh, not the earliest, but one of the early ones of any scale and having any relation to human memory being uh, Ed Feigenbaum's uh, EPAM, uh, which dates to, what do you usually use, 59 or 60 for your date, some uh, date like that. We've had production systems uh, since the 60s or earlier. Uh, we have today all sorts of parallel systems, uh, connectionist systems, and PDP. So these are the non-limits on uh, artificial intelligence. Well then, why haven't we done the whole job? Uh, why don't we uh, uh, have today uh, all of the AI programs that we want? What is the real limiting factor? The real limits are limits on our own imagination about the processes. We're not at the state yet where we can engage computers as the real researchers in artificial intelligence. We still have to do a lot of the thinking ourselves, and uh, we haven't, we haven't uh, shown ourselves powerful enough uh, to uh, have uh, uh, to do all of that. Uh, it was mentioned, I guess, by Ed this morning that one of the real, let me call it a bottleneck at the moment because it's not a, a uh, solved problem, one of the real bottlenecks in, uh, in artificial intelligence today because it's the key to very many other things in artificial intelligence uh, is natural language. Uh, we have capabilities now to, to understand the spoken word, that is to recognize uh, natural language is spoken, to speak it in a sort of a, a way uh, to, to some level. Uh, what is largely lacking in the natural language domain uh, is good connection uh, between the syntax level of language uh, and the semantics of language of handling the meanings uh, of the things that we are, uh, that we are uh, dealing with. Even quite effective and sophisticated language translation schemes today, like the ones that are chugging away in some building in this campus, uh, translating into, I guess, Spanish and Japanese or some such languages, translating uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, manuals for, uh, uh, for plows and uh, tractors and other agricultural equipment for some manufacturers, for Caterpillar that we're doing that. Uh, uh, even there, the reliance of those systems is largely on syntax, or at most, on certain semantic ideas which get incorporated in the syntax of that, in that system. If I'm out of date on that, and it's advanced further, Raj will correct me uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, We've had limits on our imagination about reasoning and thinking in human terms, and even the weird idea that somehow or other that reasoning has to do with formal logic. And I think that has put some limits on uh, where we've gone, how fast we've gone. But perhaps the more serious limit, even the more serious than limits on our, uh, on our imagination, uh, is the organismic environment surface itself. And that, of course, is the surface between syntax and semantics. Semantics, the meanings of things, are out here. What we do about them, the processing we do about them, are in here. Now, that's not a problem peculiar to artificial intelligence. Throughout the world of engineering of every kind, the big design problems are almost always in the interface between the device and its environment. And why is that? That is because you are designing the device and you can control what you put into it and the way you put into it, but you're not designing the environment. That's what you have to adapt to. And the interface uh, has to make that transformation from information out here to information inside there. Furthermore, you have to deal with whatever complexity is in their interface. You have no control over that. Whereas inside, you can make things as smooth and simple as your wits will allow you. Just as an example, if you look at any complex manufacturing process, 
the steel industry that starts with a raw material. The first thing you do is to simplify and homogenize the raw material. You never try to make anything out of it until you have made it into a much simpler and smoother material. Then it's inside your system uh, and you can do with it what you like. And so one of the things we didn't understand when, when AI started out, I think you've heard this metaphor before, we said, well, you know, it'll be easy to simulate the kinds of things that tractor drivers do and all those other useful people uh, who aren't college professors. Uh, <laughs> what's really going to be hard is to simulate the deep thoughts that college professors have <laughs> or, if you're not a college professor, the deep thoughts that experts in my profession have. You can, if you're not a chess player, oh yes, you can simulate chess players, but if you're a chess player, you know that that's the one field that computers are never going to, never going to do. Why did I pick that one? Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so, what turned out to be the real challenge in artificial intelligence, there are lots of real challenges, but the one that has stuck along for a very long time, uh, one of the big channels is, uh, is the input-output challenge. And that means speech recognition, visual pattern recognition, I have all the experts sitting in the front row here uh, on those things, uh, understanding visual and auditory uh, patterns, picture and speech uh, recognition. And that had to, there were limits there uh, on the hardware and the software. To make rapid progress in that, and I think we are making very rapid progress at the present time, uh, we had to get computers with speeds enough, high enough and with memories large enough so that the systems could deal not simply with static stimuli, with photographs, uh, but could deal with dynamic stimuli, uh, with, with continuous pictures of the environment, either auditory uh, and or uh, visual. For speech, that's obvious, and speech is a, 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 uh, something that proceeds through time. Uh, for pictures, it's less obvious, but still true, that it is easier to find out what's going on in a scene uh, if you can trace that scene over a short period of time than if you have to do those inferences from static information. And that's something that, was only, that could only enter into the uh, technology uh, when we had big enough and fast enough uh, computers. I haven't uh, I mentioned the third component of the interaction with the environment, which of course is also crucial, and that is to understand motor actions uh, and their controls. And I did mention the, the fourth one, really, is to understand the semantics of language, namely, what kinds of systems we have to have that can use the symbol structures we have inside the system uh, to interpret the scene outside the system that we're trying to think about. Now, the, the, that leads us to robotics and the argument, which is my primary thesis here, uh, the argument that robotics is at the very core of the artificial intelligence research that we should be doing now and that we will need to be doing uh, in the visible future. I'm not going to put dates on this uh, in the way that that Ed Fredkin did, or that Ed uh, Feigenbaum did, but let's just talk about something vague called the future during your working lifetimes, let's put it that way. Robotics is that part of artificial intelligence and of computer science which forces us, and human beings always have to be forced to do anything that requires real work. It's the part of artificial intelligence which forces us to recognize that there's a real world out there and that that real world is never identical with the world that we are imagining at any given moment. And why is that important? It's important because to deal with real human intelligence, which after all evolved to live in that kind of a real world, to deal with real human intelligence, we have to be able 
to build systems which, although they're only capable of holding this very incomplete, this very uh, sketchy and inaccurate picture of the real world in their heads at any one time, have to nevertheless get around in the real environment. And if they think the environment is one way, but the environment is really another way, they're going to sooner or later fall on their faces. And the way they avoid that, we, I guess I should be saying rather than they, the way we avoid that is by having continual feedback from the environment and the ability to continually revise our internal models of the world uh, in the face of what we learned about the real world outside. Now that may seem a small thing, but just contrast that with even such a feat uh, as playing chess well enough to beat Kasparov. Uh, in the case of chess, the model of the game inside the computer is exactly what the game is. Uh, and uh, in some sense, not in the sense that you can process all of it, but in some sense, all of the information is there. In real life, uh, a, uh, uh, a humorously small part of all of the information is there uh, at, uh, at any time. So what we are dealing with in uh, robotics is the task of not simply intelligence of the kind that can operate uh, with its own controllable model of the situation, but with intelligence that can carry out this task of continually adapting to what is really, uh, is really uh, uh, out there. I think you can look at the history uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, recognize that the lack of necessity to do that uh, in uh, tasks outside of robotics uh, really did limit our imagination and really did limit the tasks that we, uh, that we uh, uh, took on. We, we were lazy. Uh, and I don't think we need to apologize for that. I think it's a great idea for any science to do the easy things first uh, and then to use what we learn from the easy things to do the, uh, to do the hard things. I think it was a very sensible strategy, although I don't think anybody did it that way because it was a sensible <laughs> strategy. Uh, the motives don't, uh, uh, don't matter. And as a result of that, uh, I think a great deal has been achieved that can make the route to the next stage, the robotic stage of artificial intelligence, uh, a much easier route. I shouldn't put that all in the future, of course. We already have had substantial, uh, substantial progress, uh, both uh, towards speech recognition through uh, visual uh, achievements uh, and uh, motor reactions to those. And I could mention a few of the things that have happened around here, but you're all familiar. Uh, with some of the accomplishments here and elsewhere uh, in those uh, respects. <clears throat> but most of our accomplishment until the very recent past has been accomplishment of that simpler task of working uh, inside the head. And what has it led to? Uh, people continually say, or I hear people say continually, uh, well, uh, in the future, we will know something about how people think. Uh, people have say that have not ever, I think, spent very much of their lives really doing a serious study of how people think. Because, the, well, let me give you uh, a little example. It is sometimes said that very strong evidence today that computers don't yet really think artificial intelligence programs don't really think, is that even when they do something that's kind of neat and looks like thinking, like playing a great chess game, uh, still they only do it in a very narrow range. We human beings have all of this generality about us. We can think about almost anything. Now there's a very simple test you can perform on that. I don't know whether the laboratory experiment has been made. I don't know whether you could get it funded but a very simple test. 
Uh, just let any one of us, one of you, I guess, I don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> let any one of you be transported and dropped with a parachute, uh, be transported to the middle of the New Guinea jungle, uh, dropped in, by parachute down on the land and left there. And the question is, how many days would you survive? Now we know that there are natives in New Guinea who survived for quite a large number of generations. We call them savages or primitive people or all other, uh, other terms of that, uh, of that sort. Uh, and yet they survive. The plain fact is that we human beings, far from being generalists, are extreme specialists. Uh, we have little areas of expertise. They may be areas like how do you get along on a daily basis with other people in your society? Still a little area of expertise as you learn when you go to another society. We have little areas of expertise and we're pretty good. But if you take any little area of expertise, we're already at the point and have been, well, perhaps since Dendro, have been at the point or since the speech recognition system, uh, where we can perform all sorts of particular tasks at a good human professional level. So the, the task of AI in the future, or even in the present, is not to demonstrate that computers can think. They've been thinking for 45 years. It's not to demonstrate that a computer, when it has the proper knowledge base and program, uh, can operate as an expert in special areas. The new tasks uh, are the tasks of allowing computers to act more effectively than they have been acting uh, in areas that involve this intricate in, uh, interaction uh, with the environment. Speech, vision, motor activity, uh, and language. And I think we can find uh, enough excitement there uh, to keep us all busy uh, until at least Ed's atomic computer is in operation. Thank you.